Larry made the projector sack up 50% faster by removing the chill. <laughs> Will HDMI work? Will HDMI work? Will HDMI work? Sometime in this century, maybe. Oh, that's that worked. HDMI as well. Before. Very, very good. Last night I attended, as a lightning talk man you have social responsibilities, the party of the Kiwi guys. And so we were talking at the beach about romantic photos on the laptop of Larry Hastings. He will talk a short update of the galactomy. Give him a big hand. It's probably poor form, but you won't understand this lightning talk unless you've watched my talk from probably May 17 of this year. Uh, May, I gave this uh, talk about what's new with the galectomy back at PyCon US. If you haven't seen that talk, uh, this is a YouTube link. Um, I hope you can write that down very quickly. Anyway, I only have five minutes, so I'm going to go quickly. Um, here's an overview. This is the last important slide from that talk showing you that wall time, the amount of time that it takes to run a C Python program in the galectomy versus not in the galectomy, has been getting much better. Um, uh, when I was done with it in May, I haven't really touched it much since, um, this black line is showing you what the galectomy is like versus the red line, which is what uh, C Python is like. So I'm catching up very quickly. So while I was testing during uh, the end of May, I noticed that uh, memory consumption sometimes would go crazy. Already it was too high, which I wasn't really worrying about. I was like, I'll fix memory later. But sometimes it'd be two gigabytes for this simple program, and sometimes it would be six gigabytes, and sometimes it would be 10 gigabytes, and then when out of memory, it would crash. I, I knew something was going wrong, and I didn't have anything else to look at, so I thought, okay, I'll look at this problem. Um, inside of CPython, there are two ways that it can allocate memory. There's normal C uh, library malloc, and then there's what's called the small block allocator, which is Python's own special thing for small objects. Um, I determined very quickly whatever was allocating all this memory was doing with the small block allocator, and so I had to add instrumentation to figure out who was allocating all that memory. So here's the result of that. I printed out this very pretty thing. You can't read that, of course, it's too small. But one of these is 100x, the next category. I'll zoom in on that. One particular block of memory, th these, are, these are allocated by size. So there was, we were allocating objects in the range of 473 bytes to 480 bytes, and we allocated over 8 million of them. The next largest allocation was in, on the order of 15,000. So what is this object? I had to add more instrumentation, and then I figured out that it's frame objects. A frame object represents a function call in a running Python process. And uh, my Fibonacci benchmark is, of course, doing loads and loads and loads of uh, function calls. So um, I had to figure out why we were allocating all these function call objects. So I added some statistics to that. And that showed me that we were allocating 5,000 of them simultaneously. Now, this is a little crazy, because if you think about Fibonacci, the way that a bad recursive Fibonacci works. If you call fib of 30, the stack never goes more than 30 deep. So why am I allocating 5,000 of it at the same time? This is actually in a single-threaded program, by the way. I wasn't even doing multi-threaded at this point. So why do I have 5,000 of them if I only use 30? There is actually a free list for uh, frameless objects inside of Python because they're such a hot object, they get reused all the time. So why isn't the free list working? Why am I allocating 5,000 at the same time? So I added a bunch more logging inside of uh, the galactomy, and I produced a graph. So the, what, this is what the graph looks like. Red, um, all I did is it, it's printing out bars. A red bar means we allocated a frame from the free list. That's the thing that's fast and we like that. Green means we allocated a frame from uh, malloc because the free list was empty. Blue means we deallocated a frame. The free list wasn't full yet, so we put it on the free list. And black means we deallocated frame and the free list was full. And so we had to give it back to C. We had to free it normally. And the plot looks like this. It's super bursty. So what's going on is, um, if you again, if you remember my talk, I talked about this reference count manager, this thing that handled reference counts and got rid of all of the contention. But it had a lot of delay. What's going on is that we free one of these free lists. And then it waits for a long time, and then the reference count manager handles it, and then it says, oh, it's done, we're gonna give it back, and it puts it back on another list, and then it gets dealloced eventually. So there's a long delay before it gets dealloced, and the dealloc is where it gets put on the free list. So now there's this enormous delay between the last person getting rid of the free list, who wasn't interested in it anymore, and it actually getting on the free list again. 
So I have various ideas on how to solve this. I might very carefully watch when free list objects are ever given back and then uh, if anybody takes a reference to a free list, the free list, uh, frameless objects need to obey reference count rules. But if I happen to know that I created it and I haven't given anybody else a reference to it, so nobody can have a reference to it right now, maybe I could just put them on the free list and, and uh, go on with my life. Or maybe I just need to create lots of them and do it in such a way that I'm not spending all of this memory like crazy. But the the, the purpose of me giving this talk was just to show you, A, there's nothing that's incredibly difficult about working on the galactomy. It's just a lot of work and a lot of st statistics and a lot of thinking about what could be the problem and, and figuring out what the problem is. And I'm still confident that I'm not going to run into a prob any problems that I can't solve. The major problem is figuring out what the problem is in the first place. I'm done. Woo! Alex, can you please set up? Thank you very much. And oh, you don't need a setup. I don't need it. That's wonderful. Uh, Google Summer of Code Experience, Alex Maxim. Give him a big hand. Hello. I want to talk about a story, um, about a story that happened to me. Um, everything uh, begins in 2016, last year, with, um, with a presentation about uh, GSOC and what is that. So um, this happened in my college and I was very interested in it. Why do you think I was interested in it? What? Money, money, I, right? Okay, so when I uh, when I heard about how much how much money can I get from it, my eyes turned like stars. Okay, I think you too. Okay. After I tried to, I tried with a koala organization to enter in GSOC. I tried to some issues. Uh, also, I was very I have uh, I had uh, much to work in my college too, so I had to do stuff. I had to do work for college and also uh, for the organization to enter in GSOC. Uh, the announcing day had, has come, and what do you think so? Those idiots didn't get me in. <laughs> okay, I was very frustrated and very angry. I failed. I mean, I f just failed, okay? And after a month or two months, I, uh, I stepped back and try to figure out why I didn't uh, enter in GSOC. So I couldn't enter because I sucked. Okay? It wasn't their fault, it was my fault. Okay? So when you try to blame something, try first to figure to understand if you aren't yourself the, the one who just, just failed, okay? Don't blame someone. After uh, this year, I tried again to enter in GSOC. So, it was like 
something very difficult. I had a friend, I have a friend, a colleague that helped me a little, that pushed me, so I can get stuff done and so on. Again, the uh, announcing day have, has come, and guess what? <laughs> yeah, I entered. <laughs> Okay, so what do you think about it? Uh, I want to uh, I want to understand you to uh, learn from it if you can. Maybe you know. I don't know. I want three things. Three things that would would want to remember. Uh, Perseverance, focus, and get your shit done. Thank you. Thank you very much. I need Daniel Pope on the stage. And please set up. While he's setting up, I've got an announcement from the bitey or bitty.com team. There'll be an informal meetup about Bitcoin, Ethereum, and blockchains in general. It will happen uh, at the sea, by the sea, in front of the Tiki Chiranguta Beach Bar. That's the same like the Kiwi uh, party was last year. Note, there will be some free beer. So some, some will, will still be there. But it's an informal meeting, not endorsed by the European Society and not uh, liable from them, but it's from the Bitty team. Please raise your hand if you would be interested so they can know how much beer they have to order. Please raise your hand. Bitty team, can you count very quick? We have two, three, four, five. It's around 15 to 25 in the ballpark. That's the same as the Ethereum course right now. Now, give a big hand to Daniel Pope. Thank you. It was working. You screwed up again. Oh, really? <laughs> you killed it. It was good. Oh. Okay, well, uh, maybe that will come back. You, you come back, okay. Um, can we have Oscar Najira? Okay, okay. Oh, no, no, you, you do it with a chair. It's oh. even better. Oh. Oh. The, uh... Give him a big hand for the big chair. <laughs> Uh, you know, you know. I always skipped it when when oh. Rob oh. made it. Oh. Uh, and what will you? Do? No, 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 no. You, you, you have to give money. That's not a Python Software Foundation approved back rub. Really? Yeah, I did not go in the qualification. Yeah, you need to do the training. So, okay, I don't have slides. Um, so. You will notice I am not the guy who has previously done this. Um, and the, the guy who previously did this was Rob Collins, who is sadly no longer with us. He died last year. Um, he's a great guy. Uh, he's, he was uh, always cheery. Um, he contributed to, to my projects, and he, he sprinted alongside me at EuroPython in 2015. And I think he would like it if we continued the tradition of massages in aid of the Python Software Foundation. So, <laughs> so for this, we need you. Uh, so you are going to give massages. Um, the massage training will be tomorrow in uh, the uh, Ar Argo, Arco room, which is a breakout room. If you forget that, it's on the, the uh, breakout uh, open space board. Um, and we'll give massages at the social on Thursday. So 
These massages are in aid of the Python Software Foundation. The Python Software Foundation, um, uh, it protects the intellectual property of Python, um, and it also sort of fundraises and gives grants for, uh, uh, well, it runs PyCon US, uh, gives grants to uh, your meetups, uh, to Python projects that benefit the community, um, PyPI, stuff we all use. Um, so, uh, it's a great cause. The Python Software Foundation is a charity, so I want you to give. So I want you to volunteer to give massages, um, and and come and, and, and learn it, um, and also uh, it, like give generously during the social. Um, you can also come and just learn to to massage along with us. You don't have to uh, actually volunteer to give massages. Um, to change the topic slightly, I recently got engaged. Woo! Thank you. And that is entirely due to my massage skills, these, these talented hands. I can, you know, my, my fiance just loves my massages. Uh, so thank you, Rob Collins, for all you taught me. Um, so, uh, yeah, please, please contribute. Please come along, learn how to massage. Tomorrow it's at 2 p.m. in Arco. Um, and if you don't want to do that, uh, you can. Uh, so uh, you can just donate to the PSF anyway. We'll probably sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, stop you and say, you know, give money for a massage or else. Uh, and uh, I mean, like most people in previous years, we've got more money out of people avoiding uh, having massages because it is like the, the heat makes people quite sweaty. Um, so, uh, like if you if you don't want to be massaged, you can give money to get out of having a massage. <laughs> so that's it. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Daniel. Oscar, are you still setting up? That looks good. I was always interested in the statistics by Rob, uh, how many paid for going away and how many paid for getting a massage. Interested on the updates. I need Thomas Walton to come to the staging area. And maybe the Bitey guys, they have the place coordinate. I'm assuming that meetup will be around 8 o'clock-ish. Is that correct? Yes, 8 o'clock-ish, it's an Irish time stamp, it's not a German time, 8 o'clock-ish. <laughs> okay, wonderful. So yesterday we were um, philoso doing philosophical thoughts about things that are supposed to be romantic. And there was one thing, there was a lot of profiles with, I like long walks on the beach. I went to the beach, I stood there for hours and expected thousands of young ladies walking long walks on the beach. But the only thing that happened was uh, some old guys with not a lot of teeth trying to sell me fake Rolex. So, <laughs> never trust anything on the internet. We have three cables now. Hey, that looks good. That looks white, not so good. Okay. Um, okay. I have to do it without. Uh, you can the do slides. without slides. That's good. So uh, we will be talking about Sphinx Gallery. Learn, teach by example. Give him a big hand. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm going to present you a side project that I've been uh, leading, and it's called Sphinx Gallery. And the main idea is to help teaching your software uh, because. When you are new to a software package and you want to learn it fast, you barely approach it uh, through the documentation. And uh, what are those approaches you have is usually I have a question, how would I do something? And then the answer is stack overflow. Uh, but sometimes you don't even know what to ask. And then it has been a wonderful resource. I don't know if, uh, who knows the Matplotlib gallery? Oh, okay more or less, uh, half of the audience. And there it's uh, very intuitive to me because I have more or less an idea of what I would like to see and then I visually scan the gallery until I find a plot that does what it would look like. And then I click it. Uh, and then the idea came, why cannot we have this in every other open source project that at least has um, uh, graphics or um, 
text output. So I uh, developed what is Sphinx Gallery, which is just a Sphinx plugin that you can put in your conf.py, just import a Sphinx Gallery and tell, well, I have here a bunch of scripts, and that will just render a new matplotlib gallery, but for your project. And you can always version control these uh, Python files. And they will be always parsed to an HTML. You can enjoy all the RST syntax so that you have a really rich visuals and, and text. Uh, all the math parsers if you're working with um, scientific formulas. And on top of that, uh, there's always an exporter that takes all your Python files to Jupyter notebooks so that uh, people using your software can download them and try them directly out. And yeah, I'm trying to hold the sprint on the weekend. If you want to join uh, and learn the experience of a software project, you can help me uh, continue developing this project. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> now, Alex will try to help Thomas about memory leaks and adapter leaks. So please tell. Two to three jokes now? Two to three jokes. I haven't Please. prepared that many. But I well, want to. Tell jokes. Oh, it's. <laughs> ah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Good. When is a joke uh, not a joke? No. When is a memory leak not a memory leak? Thomas Walton, give him a big hand. Hello, my, my name is Thomas Walton. I work for Cisco. Um, I want to share some experience I have of why, when a memory leak is not a memory leak, because Python is a great language, surely it doesn't have memory leaks. But a colleague sent me this graph, and it's from the end of a test, and Python's at the yellow line, so you can see that the memory usage was up to 12 gigabytes, then the OS killed it because it was, had no memory left. And so why was my program leaking 12 gigabytes of memory and then having to be killed? But, so I've, I've come across this before, this wasn't my first time debugging a memory leak, so this, I thought, I've thought of three reasons when a memory leak in Python is not a memory leak. So the first one is really obvious, when you still got references to the objects. Here's an example from some a library, JSON RPC lib, please don't use it. Um, if, if the author's here, I apologize, but it keeps all the requests and responses in history. So unless you want to delete them every time you make a request, um, it's gonna leak memory. And um, that's really annoying, because as a user, you just make a request and you think it's, it's gonna, dis it's, just a request and you deal with a response. So, um, yeah, so, I th so I've done this before, I've seen this, so I use, I use the object, object graph module. Now other modules are available, it's the PyAmpler module um, we heard about the other day. Um, so I, I used object, object graph before, so I started with object graph show growth. This, this seemed pretty good. Um, it's, I could see, I, I've got seen some, some objects that were in use, so I ran that during my test and I got this. So, it's looking hopeful. I'm seeing some leaks in these log message objects. I've got 60,000 of them in memory. So, good thing now. I can, go, I can use object graph to find out what's referencing them. So, there's a random, I can randomly pick a log message that's in memory, and then I can ask object graph to draw me all the back references to those objects. So, I came up with a diagram like this, which I have to say I was a bit disappointed with, because that's exactly right. That was, that's how the, the architecture, shows the architecture of the program's a bit messy, but it was exactly what I was expecting, and that the, the log message on that deck will get processed and, and will free the memory after time. But that didn't fit with the symptoms of the bug. So to avoid any doubt, I turned off the bit of the code that used that deck, and the problem still happened. And this is what my sort of printouts were looking like, and it was pretty rubbish. Right? There was no growth. So I got, a bit, I got a bit desperate, I started turning off the thing. I thought I found what bit of the code made this problem. So I drew some object graphs of it. Um, but the object graph looked like this. And in fact, that's not even it, because it looked like this. Or I can't actually fit it all on the screen, because that's how big it was. It's a seven megabyte PNG. Um, so that was useless, completely useless. So I thought maybe, it's, maybe this is a Python 2.7 program. It's still old, I'm afraid. So maybe it's when the interpreter doesn't return your freed memory, which if you do this in Python 2, um, if you make a list, a massive list, and then delete it, you'll find that Python is still using loads of memory. Um, there's more details on Stack Overflow. I don't know the details full, but fortunately, that's no longer the case in Python 3.3, so you don't need to worry about it too much anymore. Um, but it wasn't this either. So I was a bit stuck. It was neither. What do I do? Well, I scratched my head, and I came to... Uh, I realized that I looked at top and thought, oh, my program is running at 100% CPU all the time. 
That's not great. And I'm doing a lot of network I.O. So what's happening? So I finally came to my answer, which I can't say I still understand properly. But where's memory leak, not memory leak? Well, it's in the twisted TCP server send buffer. Because in twisted, it was just stuffing stuff onto this temp data buffer, which didn't seem to be leaking an object graph. Um, but basically, be careful if you're doing, if you're doing network I.O. and you're running at 100% CPU. You may find your buffers fill up. And even when your clients disconnect, it may still be stuck in the buffer. I'm assuming that's a twisted bug, but never mind. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thomas. <laughs> so I need Maximilian Schultz to come and set up, and I need Lara from last year. You may remember my saying that I won't do any job a computer can do better. Last year in Bilbao, Lara was the mother of robots, and she had a small robot there. And I knew that robot will sometime replace me as a lightning talk man. It will be the lightning talk robot. So I already prepared another career with eating carrots. And Lara, until that will happen, will guide you through lightning talks, should there happen some in the coming two days, because I'll be leaving tomorrow. And as I understood, you have an announcement which will keep our audience safe until tomorrow. You should grab that microphone from Max. Push him by side. Thank you very much. Very important announcement, Valera. So, hi, I'm Lady, as he has said. And I just have a small advice, security advice, because tomorrow is the social event. How many of you are going? Whoa, okay, so nothing important on Friday. Nice. Um, I just want to remind you that the social event is not going to be uh, ever Python exclusive. It's going to start that way, but then we are going to open to the public. And um, okay, I just want you to freak out, but I'm going to say this thing. Pit pocketers exist. Okay. <laughs> so just. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you have one. Uh, <laughs> well, okay, so I, we just want to remind you to use your common sense and just don't leave everything lying around. Look out for other Pythonista things and just be careful, okay? So, have fun. Thank you, Rosalero. <laughs> so, there's another warning. Um, there is often that scam. Uh, you put up a sign, be careful, pit pockets, and then people start touching the bag where they have their valuables to check if they're still there, and the other guy steals it from exact that place. I saw that in a TV series, not on the internet. Now give a big hand to Maximilian. <laughs> Max of course. Thank you, everyone. So um, this is an even more personal talk than yesterday. And it's kind of the prequel to the trilogy that I finished yesterday. Because this is the talk, How I Found Happiness in Life Again. Um, I use the title, Anyone Can Dig a Hole, But It Takes a Real Man to Call It Home. It's a song title of a band. And I think it kind of resonates with the feeling a lot of people have that have personal problems, which is be a real man don't show it, keep it to yourself, and just dig through it. And I don't think that is the right way to go about it. So um, two years ago, I had a lot of personal problems, which include stuff like the feeling that I had no skill. This is broadly known uh, by the term imposter syndrome. So even though I, I was still in university at that time, and even though I passed my exams and I felt like I did pretty well, I always feel, felt like a cheat. I never had the feeling that I really understood what was happening or I maybe could even use it in a job. Uh, the next thing was, that's not good enough. I was a very, very unhealthy perfectionist. Everything I did was, wasn't good enough. I didn't live up to my own standards, even though others told me it was good enough. Um, then there's stuff like, uh, I didn't feel anything was worth something if I didn't suffer for it. So if someone offered me a job because he knew me, I couldn't take the job offer because it was a gift. I didn't work for it. I didn't suffer for it. So it was no, worth nothing. 
Um, and the last thing for me was it was only success that mattered in my life. The only thing that drove me to do stuff was because I wanted to be successful. This had the positive side effect that I was very successful in the things I did because it was the only thing that drove me. When I played a video game, I was very good at it. If I, uh, at that time I played paintball and I then played in the national team uh, for a short duration. And everything I touched kind of turned into gold. And a lot of people told me, why are you sad? Because everything you do, you're being successful at it. And I, that kind of was the problem. I was being successful, I wasn't being happy. So uh, two years ago, this happened. This is a picture I drew as one of uh, the counseling sessions I took afterwards. Um, and those lines show stuff like how happy I am. Uh, how successful I felt over time, how much responsibility I had. And uh, you can see the small uh, Loch Ness monster, which was where I hit rock bottom. Uh, that was a time in my life where getting, out of, uh, getting up out of bed was a very hard thing, and um, there were multiple days or even weeks where I didn't eat anything or just laid in bed for several days without getting up, without doing anything. And at some point, um, I, uh, I was a tutor in my university, and um, we have had a, like schooling for one week uh, because we helped the first semester students, and we learned uh, how to work with groups, what we should uh, show them, and stuff like that. And after that week, uh, and probably because I knew the woman that uh, was our chef, um, I got the courage to ask her for help. So uh, she gave me the tools to build the ladder to get out of the hole. And that, all, that took almost one year. And uh, that was last year, and I started to go to conferences uh, last year. And um, what happened uh, at that time was I started to think about what I value in life and how I wanted to live my life and what I wanted to find in life. The usual question you hear about stuff like this is like, if you're 80, 90 years old and you look back, will you be happy if you are successful or will you be happy if you had a happy life? Um, and so what, what changed for me was uh, that I changed perspective from being uh, only focused on success. I uh, changed my perspective to being focused on being happy. So it wasn't important to be the best, but it was important to be happy while I did something. So I started to take on hobbies. I started to meet friends again. And um, mainly I just uh, changed the core value of my entire existence, you could say. I didn't want to be successful, but I wanted to be happy. So I would like to ask all of you, and maybe if you know someone that might, might need help, um, get up again, even if it needs a helping hand. And I know that's probably the hardest part, asking others for help. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maximilian. <laughs> OK, our next speaker will be Celestine Klein. Klein Esper. Klein Esper. Okay. You will set up the system somewhere? Or you just need to read? Okay. I, I just need to. Okay. Put it on. Can you hear me? No, no, no speak. Uh, yeah, like this? I switch it off to. Okay. 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 Hi everyone, so this is my very first lightning talk um, and I talk about something, something that most of you uh, might consider alien. It's called Energizer and it's kind of a tool to create a very uh, productive group dynamic and um, to get a little out of your comfort zone. Um, I do it a lot, a lot with uh, pupils in Python workshops. So when they're um, programming uh, microbits by using Python, and they're sitting for a long time, and um, I don't know, staring at their computer, it's nice to move a little bit, especially with a bunch of boys and girls whose hormone level and urge to move is like abnormally high. <laughs> and um, yeah, I'd like to show you um, how this works, and therefore, I want you all to stand up so 
Lay down your laptops, get up for just a moment. We are going to do something called a microwave. It's an energizer with three levels. So make sure that you can move and you don't hitting your neighbor with your elbows. Does it work? Yeah, it looks wonderful. Yeah, you, you're all beautiful. So we start with level one. Level one goes like this. Okay, level two is like this. You can do like this. Yeah, okay, it doesn't work. We're doing the level two again. Yeah, great. And level three is this. Bing. Yeah, oh my god, this is wonderful. Okay, we're gonna do this again a little bit faster. Level one. Level two. Level three. Bing. Yeah, you got it. Okay, we're gonna do this one last time. Level one. Level two. And level three. Bing. Yeah. So, um, who, who already did something like this before? Yeah, well, kind of guys. Okay, nice. Um, I wanted to introduce it um, because I think it can make you feel like being part of something big, which is a nice feeling. And um, I learned about myself that I really like to push people to make ex experiences like that. And um, this is also kind of the main target of education. Um, so like making people um, discover something new, like um, encourage them to uh, develop a little more. Um, and um, also the method, so like energizers are a tool or a method to encourage people a little more and getting a little bit more self-confident. And um, I, I think that it doesn't really matter if you loved it or hated it, like the microwave thing, because you just learn something about yourself. Um, and learning and understanding is like about confusion to uh, discover something, to be amazed or even curious, irritated, fascinated. Everything that captures you is... Uh, pushing learning and understanding forward. So, um, I think that just as you might be confused right now about this alien education method, um, pupils and teachers can be confused in the same way about coding, which is a shame because we see that coding is um, everywhere. I mean, we're at the Europython, we see that it is in politics, in the economy, even in architecture, if you remember the talk, lightning talk yesterday. And um, so it has to become a bigger part of education, it has to be more important. And that's why I'm here. I want you guys to think about how you can amaze and fascinate and making people more curious about what you're doing, because what you all are doing is amazing. And I'd really like to get it more into the education level. So, thank you very much. We need to create something sustainable with education and coding together. And we just have to do something and get out of a comfort zone. So, check out the Koala website, the Koala School, which are the microbit projects I earlier talked about. And if you have an idea or like feedback, how, you, how it make you feel, just write me. That's my mail address and thank you very much. Thank you so much. Microphone still working. I need Fabian Neumann. Fabian Neumann. He's running to the stage. And I need Paul Roland. Okay, already Fabian, please set up. So we are currently at 17.43. That's military time for a quarter to six. And we are currently at uh, lightning talk number nine of 23. <laughs> huh? Um, you should have, uh, you don't have an adapter with you. No. No. Um, but wait a minute, 
it says something? Yeah, I'll try. OK. We have many lightning talks and not a lot of time. We have this venue for a little longer than 6 o'clock. So just a feeling. Should we shut down sharp at 6 o'clock? Please raise your hand. OK. <laughs> Some people think yes. Um, should we take another half hour or more? 40 minutes or more? Oh, so the majority it goes down uh, between 30 and 40 minutes. OK, signal understood. Um, Fabian will uh, find an adapter. And we are switching to Paul, is that correct? Yes. Wonderful. Paul will be talking about slicing a carrot. That's a great thing for the bunnies with us. Because, of course, bunnies eat carrot. Alex, could you help the guys with the setup? They are, when you were standing next to them, it worked fine. Uh, One of the cables does not work. Maybe take away the cable that does not work. <laughs> Probably let's just like... Okay, that's better. No yes. cable left behind is a stupid thing. Take this cable away and... I take it. You take it down, kill the cable. Um, cable cutters are on the rise. People using yeah, is it internet streaming stuff. Doing some... No. It's working? It did. It did. Yeah, it, I saw it. Anyway, what do you get if you cross... Yes, well, we need you. <laughs> what do you get if you cross an octopus and a cow? I can try. A wizard from the ethics board and a cutting of all your funding. <laughs> it goes white and black and white and black. Can you try this one? Yeah. yeah. It's very fascinating. It's totally fascinating. One thing. It detects it. As an avid science fiction fan, what I'm very, very sorry about is that we don't have a lot of utopian science fiction. Mm, oh, maybe the only utopian solution. science fiction I can quote off my head, which is popular, is Star Trek. They have a future where people just work on bettering themselves, <laughs> getting projectors to work. Oh, we're still working You on need the to lower the resolution for people who come after me. It doesn't do full HD. It freaks out. It doesn't do what? Full, uh, full HD resolution. It says it can do it, but it freaks out for the next it speaker. Li it's lying. <laughs> anyway, how to five, 15 years to slice a carrot, five minutes to set up a projector. Yeah. Oh, right on. Give him a big hand. Hi. I'm here to tell you about a new project uh, by the Plum community, which is a new UI um, that we're currently developing. It's going to be radically simplified. Um, you may think Plone has been around forever. Yes, we have been. Uh, some people say that to me as if it's a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. It takes a long time to learn to do something well. Um, if you're a sushi chef, you can train for 15 years to slice the perfect carrot. Um, that, that long, um, long experience, we've been around for 15 years and we've made some really bad um, user interfaces, uh, mostly because developers wrote them and then there was this, well, it kind of worked, but then you had like these users that came in and put content in them and you had like, I had this beautiful setup with like patch in, uh, a folder with pages uh, if it became more than 20 and then the users came and put like 20,000 documents in and it all stopped working. So um, we are now rethinking the way we are doing it. It's showing in the background um, to make it radically more simple um, because yeah, we need to. Um, also, yeah, UI design is really hard. Um, you tend to do UI design and everything fits on screen and then somebody goes and translates your software in Finnish and it doesn't fit on the pop-up box. Um, 
or any other language that makes it really long or happens to write stuff in a different direction. Um, so it's, it's kind of hard, but we're getting there. Uh, we're getting a lot better. Uh, one thing that's really important is to have mobile first. I mean, when Plone began, um, it was fine to do it on a computer, and then somebody came along and invented mobile phones. Bastards. Uh, and now everybody's using it, and it's especially uh, uh, important. Like me, I work for a nonprofit, and most of my users are in Bangladesh and Cambodia, and their phone is the only computer they will ever have. So it's not enough to give them a stripped down version of a site, it has to work. All of the functionality has to work on mobile. Otherwise, these people cannot use the website as intended. So um, that is also a hard problem because Plone is a rather complicated um, uh, content management system. You can do a lot of things with it, which means you have to redesign it so that you can do all of those complex things. The complexity is needed but you can hide it and you can structure it so that it brings uh, the most important things to the user first. Um, the people developing that, uh, this new UI called uh, Pastanaga, which is Catalan for carrot or turnip, uh, the Catalans are not quite sure which ones, um, they come from uh, Barcelona. Um, most of them have worked at the University of Barcelona, which has a huge plan site, so they've actually also studied the behavior of users and where they struggled. So, um, yeah. <coughs> We're hoping um, that by uh, reduce, reuse, and recycle, we can uh, cut down the complexity that a complex piece of software like Plone uh, needs to have to make that in a way so that it's usable for people who are on mobile, people who are on desktops, people who speak various languages around the world, people who um, are blind, people who have, have other accessibility issues. Um, and yes, um, as I said before, um, 15 years clone is a long time, but sometimes it takes you like the fifth or the sixth attempt to get things right. I'm not saying we're getting it completely right now, but we're making a big step in the right direction. Um, there's more things on Plone going on. We have a roadmap come on Friday. And if you want to have more good weather and more nice food, we have a conference in October. Um, be welcome. There will also be pyramid tracks and other tracks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. <laughs> now, while Fabian is setting up, I need uh, Oliver Bestwalter. Make yourself seen. Very good. You don't have a setup. That's good. We can move on much quicker. And, wow, that's a desktop, that's great. Warrington, Manchester, so you're from the UK, I guess? No, no, no. No? It's from my other hobby, board gaming. It's an upcoming board game. It's a board game? It's a board game. Wonderful. Brass, right. Um, OK, you will be talking about daytime as time zone is confusing you. Yes, that's confusing. OK. We have a global company. We get confused with time zones all the time. We just agreed to always have our meetings scheduled on UTC, and even that goes wrong sometimes. Ah, oh, come on. Once again, bacon and egg walk into a bar. The bartender says, sorry, we don't serve breakfast here. That looks great. OK, then I, yeah. I don't see it on my screen. I have to. A Roman walks into a bar, raises two fingers, and gets five beers. <laughs> wow. Does it Give him a big hand. Okay. Quick, quick. <laughs> so I have to look at the screen, actually. Um, OK, yeah, this is from a uh, little quirk I encountered uh, last week and which took me uh, or stole me two hours of my life. Uh, maybe it helps somebody if I mention this here. So uh, just a little context in the beginning. Um, daytime, daytime library um, module, I think, of Python everybody knows. What does it do for us? First, the context. It's on my laptop. It's uh, Central European summertime, 11 o'clock in the morning. Python 3.4, OK, we import daytime. 
and so on, we say, um, give, me, give me the current time in UTC. It says, okay, nine o'clock, fine, everything's good. Um, then we say, okay, now give me, and it's a date time aware time, uh, time stamp, right? Because it has a time zone attached to it. Now I say, okay, give me the current time now. It gives me my local time, also fine. And then there's this function UTC now, which gives me again UTC time, nine o'clock, fine, uh, but this time without an attached um, timestamp, so it's naive. Um, so then there is S time zone, uh, uh, a method on a daytime object which basically converts uh, a daytime you have into another time zone, fine. So let's make an example, okay, daytime, give me the current date, uh, time, so now, and now convert it into time zone UTC. What happens in Python 3.4? No idea, okay. Trace back value error S time zone cannot be applied to naive date times. So there is no time zone information attached to it. So um, S time zone uh, doesn't work, which is fine because that's how it was always. Now fast forward to Python 3.6, exact same situation. Date time now as time zone UTC. Ooh, it works, and it's actually it's correct, it's nine o'clock, um, and the documentation about date time as time zone says, uh, in, changed in version 3.6, the as time zone method can now be called on naive instances. Okay, so far so good. Let's take it one step further, but now date time UTC now. So again, remember UTC now gives you UTC timestamp, but again, in a uh, naive, um, instance, so without any time zone attached. So what does it happen when I say UTC now and then convert it to UTC? What would you expect? Huh? Seven o'clock. Yeah, that's not what I would expect, but okay. Yeah. <laughs> so basically I say give me the give me current time in UTC, then convert it to UTC, but that's not UTC anymore because in UTC it's nine o'clock and not seven o'clock. Um, yeah, and that's the second part of the, um, of the change entry is that it now be, can be called on naive instances that are presumed to, uh, to represent system local time. So it takes the time zone of my system local, um, converts it and so on, and then converts it basically again, which um, yeah, for me doesn't really make sense. And now the questions I, I have, um, for one thing, does it make sense defaulting to system local time? Um, yeah, maybe, probably. Um, what's the best practice? Basically, our code broke on the assumption that there, the value error should be raised, and we relied on this, and then it failed, and I got timestamps which were four hours off, and I was looking into this and couldn't make out why. Um, the question is, um, what's the best practice now, anyway? So should we use date time now with an explicit time zone UTC, which then gives you a uh, date uh, time zone aware timestamp, um, or should maybe UTC now return an aware daytime by itself? And isn't this a breaking change? The whole change is not mentioned in Python 3.6 change log, neither in the long change log nor in the what's new section. It's really only mentioned at the uh, daytime modules as time zone um, documentation. So if you have answers for me why this was um, changed like this, maybe some uh, CPython core developer is here or knows the ticket or bug uh, that triggered this change, I would be happy to know why this is like that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. I need Miroslav to make him say visible, his, himself visible. You're Miroslav? Miroslav? Very good. And now we'll be listening to Oliver Bestwalter about what is Tox. Tox is Tux written with an O, so talk over. <laughs> no, give him a big hand. Hi. Uh, yeah, I prepared slides and everything, but seeing this technical catastrophe unfolding, I thought I don't do it. And actually, I realized I want to talk about something else anyway. I wanted to explain to you what Tox is and how it works and whatever, but it's actually not really important. And I think if you're into testing and build automation and all that kinds of things, 
the probability is pretty much 100% that you will stumble into it somehow and then figure out if you want to need it or, or use it. Uh, just as a hint, if there's a tox.ini file in any of the Python projects that you saw, then the project uses tox to automate their testing and um, whatever. You can do everything with it, um, building docs, deploying them. Um, but that's not the point. Uh, the point is um, I stumbled into that project last year. I'm, I'm a big fan of open source software for a long time, and I always thought... Uh, yeah, th there were these personal talks that inspired me a bit because there's this, uh, this feeling I'm not good enough or I can't contribute anything of value or things like that. I had that a long time. And I stumbled into that project last year and it turns out I can help. Uh, I'm now one of the core maintainers. And um, yeah, and to me it's very important to make uh, clear that A, I think if you're really interested in this kind of thing and you want to do it, then you can do it. And uh, the other thing that is even more important, I think, is we are all pretty much, um, all the technology companies are all pretty much, I don't want to say anything negative, but I mean, the word parasite comes to mind when using open source software. So we're all using it, everybody takes it for granted. If things break, people start complaining on the issue trackers and expect they get uh, free uh, support. And I think there needs to be a change of attitude, and uh, especially from the companies. And I don't think that happens from the top down. It has to happen from the roots up. Um, so I managed to um, convince my employer last year to, uh, that I can use 20% of my time for uh, do open source development, mainly talks. Uh, I was really surprised that it worked. I tried and I, I talked to them and it went up to the CTO and I had to talk to him and he listened to me and he understood that although we don't get any money directly out of it, we really need it and things break down. And so we said, yeah, go ahead. So I want to encourage everyone who has these ambitions and these ideas and is working in a company that is heavily using open source, which is pretty much every company, and they want to give something back, to try to take this route, and um, if you have questions about it, if I can give you any tips or something, just approach me. Um, yeah, that's it, basically. Thanks. Thank you very much, Oliver. Well, while Miroslav is walking to the stage, I need Pablo. Pablo, you make us visible very good. Uh, what did the cannibal get that came late to the dinner party? A cold shoulder. So Miroslav will give us one keyboard layout to rule all Latin alphabets. One keyboard to rule them all. Give him a big okay. hand. I don't have my computer with me now because I need your com to see your computers. How many of you are using the standard US keyboard layout? Oh, very nice. I like this keyboard layout. It's so simple, it's the basic one, uh, and what I like the most is that every key has only like two symbols on it, uh, and one of my, or my favorite uh, editor was uh, built for this, uh, uh, for this uh, keyboard layout, H-A-K-L, and the brackets, and dot, everything is on the uh, right place. So with me, sorry? <laughs> no, no, no. Okay, so I, I always use English layout. My hands are on, in the right position, I can do everything. Aber von Zeit zu Zeit muss ich auf Deutsch schreiben. Und auf Deutsch hat man diese komische Umleute und das scharfe S. Und wenn ich diejenigen, die mich jetzt verstehen, frage, wie viele von euch wissen, dass es seit zwei Wochen das große scharfe S gibt, genau, und das, das muss ihr irgendwie schreiben. Und Außerdem habt ihr die Querztastatur und dann die Punkte und so weiter, alles liegt irgendwie ein bisschen anders. Moje priezvisko je šedivý. Š, šedivý, áno, to š ani na anglickej, americkej, ani na nemeckej klavesnici nedostanem. To znamená, musím si prepnúť občas na Slovensku. Niekdy píšu i česky. Či už chcem napísať jednoduché, teda moje priezvisko, alebo príliš žľutevčký kúň, úpiel, ďabelské ódy, tak potrebujem slovenskú alebo českú klavesnicu. Zase je to kverc, všetky znaky sú, teda všetky interpunkcie sú niekde inde a okrem toho čísla treba robiť so shiftom. 
Tak. Est-ce que quelqu'un a déjà écrit sur un clavier français Ouais C'est quoi Ça s'appelle comment Azerti Alors, moi j'ai appris à écrire, euh, à utiliser la VI euh, sur Azerti, mais le, le problème c'est que tout est encore différent. C'est Azerti, le M, il est dans une autre ligne euh, et le point qu'on utilise dans mon éditeur préféré le plus souvent, il faut l'utiliser avec un shift. Ouais, ça fait vraiment du mal. Normalement, je ne pisse pas en polsku, je pisse de temps en temps en polsku, je n'ai pas de polsku au clavier, mais je pisse de quelqu'un qui se nomme Grzegorz Brzęczy-Szykiewicz et qui est en train de se faire un petit peu de tak to potrzebuje pisać po polsku, no a na amerykańskiej klawiaturze nie ma tego, no a polską klawiaturze jeszcze nie widziałem, także muszę znaleźć czegoś, co, co prac, na, na, na czym mogę pisać po polsku. E, Europython, a se do zaniós, era por la primera vez en Bilbao, era mi primer Europython. E, para, para encontrar un hotel o amigos, e, Tienes que escribir en castellano. Y no he nunca he visto un teclado castellano, español, pero tenía que escribir en castellano. Y adesso, Rimini, debe escribir en italiano. ¿eh? Y nueva, otra, otra vuelta, uh, es un teclado, no teclado, tastera uh, uh, italiana que no, no, nunca uh, más he visto. Uh, ma voglio scrivere in italiano. After all these cramps, two years ago, I discovered two things. For the back, it was Rob's messages, and for my hands, it was the compose key. Uh, this is a key that uh, was around uh, in uh, Unix's or Unix uh, terminals uh, in the 80s. Uh, and you can install it or activate it now in your Linux, Macintosh or Windows again. Actually, it is one key that you don't really need. It is like next to the space, some Windows or, or menu key. Um, and then you just activate it once and then on your keyboard, whether you use German, French uh, or English or US one, um, you type one modifier and then the, the letter. So it means that you also can write like Alpha characters like uh, like umlauts uh, or accent and so on, uh, but also if you type uh, compose dot dot you get three dots. If you do compose uh, one two you get the fraction and so on. Just Google for uh, compose key for your operating system and if you have any questions just come to me. As an extra tip for those who would like to use their caps lock as a control and escape T at the same time, ask me afterwards. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm not really sure if Miroslav Free knows that many languages or if he uh, pulled a Harpe Kerkeling and it just sounded like different languages. Anyway, great talk. Uh, yesterday I learned that you only need one sentence in every language. I'm handsome, give me free beer. So, now we have, um, I think, Pablo about yet another way to await. I didn't touch it. We are awaiting the Hi. projector. Give him a big hand. Um, hi, I'm Pablo and I'm going to talk to you about Async.io. So you heard a lot about Async.io um, during this Europython, previous Europython, and probably the one before. So keep calm, I'll be awaiting for you, right? So we know uh, all about await. Now, uh, how many people uh, heard about awaitables? All right, okay. So. Um, uh, these are the two peps that talk about awaitables, that implement awaitables. So uh, I'm going to show um, a few things. So basically, um, the game plan is, so we're going to take the uh, usual like iterators, like uh, 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 done the iter, done the next, and, and what, uh, anyone wants to guess what this code is going to do? This is a Jupyter notebook, by the way. Here we go. So we take our standard uh, Dunder methods and uh, append A, and we turn them into async uh, Dunder methods, right? So let's see how we can implement uh, something uh, with those Dunder methods. 
Yeah, uh, dire straits, anyone? Um, yeah, I can try. The power of Windows, by the way. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, so what are we looking here is like, uh, so you take your usual kind of, uh, so, so this is an async generator. This is what I want to talk to you about. Uh, so you probably, uh, um, you probably heard about async, genera uh, async generators during this conference. Uh, the reason why I'm standing here is because I, I came across a uh, PyPy package um, uh, presented, I think, is in PyCon 2016, which is called a synchronous generator. But now it's in the uh, standard, um, essentially, library implemented. So um, now let's have a look how it works. So basically, uh, it's an async generator that um, is going to yield something, and we, we also can inject values back into the generator as we u as we do with uh, well standard generators. Okay, so let's make sure that we create this generator. Um, so what you can see, this, this guy is going to return 42, foo, and bar, and then quit. Okay, and it's also going to listen to injected values. All right, let's run this guy. Yes. Oh, yes. We, we actually need to run this guy. So, yeah, uh, and uh, it waits one second after each uh, value. And basically, in the meanwhile, it's free to do other tasks. So that's the beauty of it. You're doing it async. Okay. Um, now, how many, so I saw quite a few hands when I asked about async uh, generators. How many people have actually used async for? All right, fewer. I was, I was going to say, I can bet money. Um, so as you can see, async for is a nice construct. Uh, obviously, it also uh, expects um, Awaitable, right? Uh, yes, awaitable. Um, so uh, here, this was just a sing. Uh, so we just use it as an iterator. In the next slide, I'm going to show like how we can communicate with the uh, generator. So okay, so here we use the standard uh, um, command. So instead of send, it's going to be generator dot a send. So we always prepend an a, right? Um, so we use an ASAND, so the generator receives the command, and on the next iteration, you can see the injected command. So now I'm printing the tuples, and uh, you can see the um, injected values here. So it's, quite, it's kind of useful. It's, uh, it's good to know that this machinery is there. I mean, we use it from time to time. Right, uh, what else is there? So in the done the methods I was shown, so there was an enter and exit. Context managers, AC context managers. So what if you have to do some heavy lifting uh, when you enter and exit uh, your context manager? Easy. All right, let's ex execute this guy and let's apply it. So now it's basically uh, code similar to the one before, uh, but now wrapped with the uh, sort of enter and exit, we'll say, hey, um, uh, entered and ex entering context, leaving context. There you go. And this is all async. All right, so um, I'm Pavlo, so this is how you can reach me, presented on Windows. Thank you very much. I need Stephen Port to come to the stage and Sebastian Nowak to make yourself visible. Stephen Ports, come, run. System is waiting. Stephen Ports will talk about an abundance of libraries. Give him a big hand. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm a physicist and a data scientist. And today I want to share with you a small story about some former colleagues of mine. Um, about uh, short of a decade ago, two, co two former colleagues started their PhDs. They figured out, okay, what kind of language do I work with this now? And they quickly found out Python uh, got, some, some quick, got some steam. And the one started out and um, didn't find the right libraries. They were just being developed, not quite mature enough. So he turned back to MATLAB and did his stuff in there. He did great with that and was fine all along. 
The other one didn't stop there. He uh, started out to build his own project. Um, he developed, he got some really uh, sleepless nights about that, developed uh, his open source project, and uh, now um, not only he himself, but quite a number of master students and bachelor students have been working with his library, creating some awesome research. Um, what I want to tell you is building these um, libraries is awesome, and nowadays that there is a, a great abundance of that. I, as a data scientist, can go there and have, like, um, import a few libraries, just run a few lines of code, and basically my application is done. And it's all thanks to you who are, we, uh, who are working on these projects, creating them, bringing them further, having them staying alive. Thank you all of you. Thank you very much, <laughs> Stefan. Now, Sebastian Noack will talk about go-to and other crazy stuff you can do with bytecode. Who says go-to is crazy? <laughs> I would not accept go-to to be crazy, but we will see what he will be doing with bytecode or hmm? trying to do. Yeah, yeah, keep on. I just talked until you get your thing running, your computer. Did you know that sharks have been longer on this planet than trees? That's correct. Now you know why they can't climb on trees. <laughs> At least it's one try of an explanation. And remember the photon who checked in and the receptionist asked, do you need the bellhop to help you with your luggage? And the photon told, no, I'm traveling light. Go to doesn't work. Daniel, do you do your presentation without a... Oh, he also has a laptop. <laughs> <laughs> Did you take the other, the, the broken one again? Oh, this one is broken? VGA. That worked last time in 2005. I also have DisplayPort, I think. Yeah, that's, I but, think. But uh, not a full-size DisplayPort. A uh, mini-size DisplayPort. Maybe you get an adapter and Daniela tells us something about PyCon UK. Don't sit down. Okay. Set up. So uh, give somebody, uh, what, what do you need? Um, an adapter of? I um, think it's mini DisplayPort to regular DisplayPort. Mini DisplayPort to regular DisplayPort. It's a ThinkPad. OK, somebody is bringing. Daniel Presida will hopefully, he promised that his laptop will work. Whoa! He will talk about PyCon UK, give him a big hand. Yeah. Okay, it was okay. good. So, um, yeah, thanks. I want to talk to you about um, PyCon UK. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Okay. What's going on? <laughs> oh, ho, ho, ho. wow. Oh. 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 <laughs> <laughs> I fooled you. Um, I just want to talk about an unfortunate incident that left us feeling rather bad, especially those of us who discovered on the 24th of June that we were going to become second-class citizens after living in Britain for 31 years, and some of us are bitterer than others. But the thing is that gambling is a terribly destructive addiction, and um, politics and our world is full of these wretched vict victims of this terrible compulsion, like our former Prime Minister David Cameron, who gambled away the future of the whole country in an attempt to win a battle in his party. And um, this is uh, uh, David Cameron. So. And um, our glorious Prime Minister for now, Theresa May, who gambled away her own government. So um, she too has... Uh, uh, anyway, 
while there's still a chance, you're very welcome to come and visit us in Cardiff for PyCon UK 2017. Um, 26th of October to the 30th, four days of talks and a day of sprints. Tickets are on sale now. Our call for proposals is open. We'll close on August the 12th. Um, as I said, our schedule and um, the black border is in recognition of our loss. Um, PyConUK.org, come and see us. It will really cheer us up. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Wonderful. And just a recommendation. Um, try to postpone the payment because the tickets will be charged in pounds and it's in free fall. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, for the guys from Iceland, it will be a very cheap trip <laughs> when you want to drink. It's cheaper in Birmingham anyway. And with the pound to the Icelandic krona, you essentially make money if you drink beer. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we're trying to... Wow, that looks good. Now he'll be talking, Sebastian, about GoTo and other crazy stuff done on DB Debian Ubuntu. Is it um, Debian or Ubuntu? Anyway. It's Debian. So, um, give me a minute. So. <laughs> Take your time. It's just running. Yeah, that looks good. Ah. So, um, who of you thinks that this code is actually valid Python code? So, what it does is you might know label and go to from C and other programming languages. So, we have uh, defined a list there, then we have a label, then if um, the, the counter variable is equals to the stop parameter. We jump to the end label, otherwise we move on with the code, append the value to the result, increment the counter, and then jump up to the begin again. Um, pretty much straightforward, traditional programming style using goto. And this is actually valid Python code. So um, that is because um, go to dot begin and label dot begin uh, is actually valid syntax for attribute lookup, but in this case, those variables don't exist. So if we try to run that code, it will fail with a name error. However, I've written a library. And if you decorate that function and then run it, it will <laughs> And the way this works is basically uh, by rewriting the bytecode. Um, what this, uh, what this, uh, what the with go to function decorator function here does is it calls a patch code function, which then calls find label, labels and go tos. And what this function does, it passes a, it calls another function that passes a byte code. And uh, now back to find labels, we identify load global and load name um, operations uh, followed by load utter and popped or and uh, followed by load utter and pop top instructions, since this is a bytecode that is generated for an attribute lookup, and if the object the attribute lookup is performed on has a variable named label or go to, we pass them as such and then generate new bytecode in the end. And yeah, and it's, um, it's on PyPy, you can install it using pip install go to statement, use it, go ahead, use it in production. <laughs> it's, it's also on GitHub, and it's compatible with Python 2.6 onwards. Uh, also PyPy, so, yeah. Wonderful. <laughs> Sebastian, before you leave, I have one more question, which is the pep request we have to vote for to get it into Python 3.7. Yeah, I would, I would second that, yeah. <laughs> okay. 
there will be a pep request to get it in Python 3.7, and maybe it will be turned down, maybe not. Harut D will talk about SQL alchemy and Chanku object relational mapper. By the way, does the name Pavlov ring a bell? Yeah, it's bad for this late hour. Wow. The desktop backgrounds get beautiful and beautiful. Is beautiful a word? Not really, huh? Nope. So, people often ask me why I walk along the stage so much and not stand still. There are two reasons. I have a fitness tracker counting my steps. And the other thing, I know from relativity when I'm moving, Subjectively, my time is moving slower, and I'm just uh, getting older faster for you guys, or something around that. So, Harut will talk about SQL Alchemy. Give him a big hand. So, uh, we need to use Django sometimes, and uh, Django has many problems, and one uh, that uh, it is not uh, very fast in some cases. So, uh, es especially when doing queries uh, with some complex uh, conditions. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> so, uh, what people usually do, uh, as I know, they uh, just write uh, raw SQL queries, um, but I don't like it because we lose the power of uh, SQL construction and it's not fun. And uh, what if we could? Uh, Memoirs a result of uh, SQL compile and uh, uh, apply, just apply parameters after. But it's not so easy in Django because Django does uh, parameter applying in the depth of the call stack and it's not a layer to, to be used in, in this way. But uh, there is alternative, and let's do some chemistry. There is a thing called SQL alchemy, <laughs> you know. Uh, it is well layered, and one of the layers is uh, SQL constructor, SQL uh, layer, and we can use it uh, with Django. There is a uh, Library called Algemi, which translates uh, Django models to SQL Algemi tables, and uh, there is a thing in SQL Algemi that is called uh, baked queries that uh, memorizes, uh, re partially memorizes the result of compile of uh, SQL Algemi queries. So we can combine them and uh, do things uh, like this. Uh, with almost, uh, if, if uh, the same query was happened uh, before, we can just uh, construct a key for key cache and look up into the di into dictionary, get uh, SQL, row SQL and uh, execute him with Django uh, row, query, row query set. So, and the overhead is minimized drastically. So, here is a proof of concept code. It's not uh, well written, but it works, I hope. And uh, this company I work for, so. Thank you very much. Thanks. Now I need Mark and Lyra to come on the stage. You. And 
I've got sad news. Today's lightning talks are over. Give a big hand to yourself and all the speakers. Thank you so much. Uh, sorry, we are over. We, okay. have, we are getting so thrown out of the thing. Uh, the good news, there will be lightning talks on Friday. Woo! <laughs> Mark and Nira will be hosting them. I'll be spending the Friday with my father, who has the th 83rd or 84th birthday. I never know because it's off by one error and I'm a programmer. So I'll be leaving. Thank you very much for having me. Give a big hand to the lightning talk for Friday. And enjoy your evening and always be aware your pockets may be picked. <laughs> See you next year or somewhere else in the Python universe. Bye.